Are you a fan of local bookstores or coffee shops? Or have you ever had to go to an urgent care clinic? If the answer is yes, you're probably a customer of a booming industry that may be imperiling the U.S. economy. I'm talking about a multi-trillion dollar business called private equity, which is just business lingo for people who buy private companies. Don't get me wrong, private equity plays a useful role in the economy by helping small companies grow and reviving struggling businesses, but they also operate in the shadows. Why do you linger in the shadows? People outside the industry don't even know what businesses they own or how much, and that's a problem. To understand the danger, you first need to know how private equity works. Let's say a company can't get funding because it's too small to go public or too risky to get a bank loan. Private equity will step in and help. If things go well, it's a win for everybody. Companies grow, new jobs are created, and investors make money. But the problem is private equity isn't just interested in making a lot of money. It wants to make a boatload of money. And the way you do that is with leverage. It's common for private equity investors to buy companies with 90% borrowed money and just 10% of their own money. That kind of leverage can hugely magnify the gains, as you might have experienced if you bought a home in recent years with a mortgage. But it can also magnify the losses, especially when used to buy risky businesses. And that's where the danger lies. I'll come back to that danger in a minute. First, let me explain how we got here. Private equity has been around for decades, but it really got going in the 1980s, which probably isn't a coincidence. When it comes to leverage, interest rates are key because the more cheaply you can borrow, the more money you can make and vice versa. Well, it happens that in the mid 1980s, inflation started to come down from record highs and interest rates came down with it, ushering in a golden age for private equity. There was also little competition back then, because the industry was just getting going. So private equity investors could buy the best companies cheaply, at least by today's standards. Add to that cheap leverage and you have a recipe for making a fortune. And they made a fortune. Early investors like elite universities, Harvard and Yale, made big investments into private equity and were richly rewarded. In the 1980s, average returns from private equity were in the range of 15 to 22% a year and similar through the 1990s, according to one study that tracked the performance of nearly 1,400 private equity funds. As word got out, other big time investors, including pensions, university endowments, and rich families piled into private equity. It's the latest craze, all the cool dogs are doing it. Meanwhile, interest rates continued to decline, falling to near zero for much of the 2010s, spurring even more investment into private equity. What was once a cottage industry with several multi-billion dollars to invest in the early 1980s ballooned into a multi-trillion dollar business. But as Chris Wallace famously warned, the more money you make, the more problems you get. One problem is that the flood of cash into private equity has to be invested somewhere and there are only so many businesses to buy. Think of a category of business, and there's a good chance private equity owns it. In the short spin around the Brooklyn neighborhood of Park Slope, you can stop at a private equity-fueled coffee shop, Blank Street Coffee, a PE-backed bookstore, Barnes & Noble, a PE-backed yogurt spot, Pinkberry, and a PE-backed waxing chain, European Wax Center. That flood of cash, is also forcing investors to pay a lot more for private businesses than they used to, which reduces the payoff. Private equity investors get paid when they sell their companies to someone else. That same 2012 study I mentioned earlier estimated that private equity returns had fallen to a range of 7 to 13 percent by the 2000s. That's roughly in line with what investors expect going forward. Even more problematic, though, is that more investment into private equity requires more loans for leverage. Except most of those loans aren't coming from banks because private equity is risky business. And by law, banks can only take so much risk. It's coming instead from private investors. It's called private credit. And it basically means that individuals are playing the traditional role of banks only without the regulation and oversight meant to keep banks from failing. So you see what's going on here. We have a multi-trillion dollar business buying growing chunks of the US economy with borrowed money and another multi-trillion dollar business, private credit, feeding it loans. And few, if anyone outside the industry knows what's going on. It's probably, probably fine. Except that cracks are starting to show in private equity land. Traditionally, private equity's main goal was to take its companies public or to sell them to other businesses. Now, private equity owns more businesses than they can realistically unload. So private equity firms are increasingly selling their businesses to each other or to businesses who are themselves owned by other private equity firms. How can I do that? That's basically a pyramid scheme which the chief investment officer of Europe's biggest asset manager warned in 2022. 
Interest rates have risen recently to levels not seen in two decades. And just as lower interest rates were a boon for private equity, higher rates are a major drag. Those higher rates could now trigger a vicious downward spiral for the industry. Here's how. If private equity firms buckle under the weight of higher rates and start defaulting on their debt, private credit markets will demand higher interest rates as compensation for greater risk, which will trigger even more defaults. In a world where private equity firms are selling businesses to each other, Every default means one less buyer. You could easily have a scenario where there are too many companies in default needing to be sold and too few buyers to bail them out and the whole pyramid comes down. Just like an old fashioned run on banks, but that wouldn't be the end of it. Not even close because private equity is burrowed so deep, too deep into the US economy. No one would be spared. Or as financial regulators might say, private equity has become a systemic risk. Systemic risk. Systemic risk. Many businesses that consumers rely on would struggle to operate or disappear, and many jobs would be lost. It would almost certainly be a drag on the broader economy. How big a drag and how likely it is to happen is hard to say because we know so little about the secretive world of private equity. Consider this. There are nearly a thousand US public companies with a market value less than $100 million. Most private equity firms are bigger than that, so there's no reason why they shouldn't be held to the same standard. We didn't always require public companies to disclose their financial statements, and it didn't end well. It ended with a speculative mania during the roaring 1920s that resulted in one of the biggest stock market crashes in history and the start of the Great Depression. In response, Congress required companies that trade on stock exchanges to regularly disclose their financial statements to the public. Warren Buffett, probably the greatest investor of all time, has accused private equity of not calculating its results honestly. Private equity funds were the returns are really not calculated. They're not calculated in a manner that I would regard as honest. The way to fix it and to get our hands around the risk that private equity poses to investors and the broader economy is to require the industry to disclose its financial results before we have to wonder why we didn't do it sooner.